Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriot Stock Podcast. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada, getting ready for Super Bowl 58. LVIII. LVIII. 58. Um, Sounds right. And as we do so, we will be providing you every single day with a podcast edition. And we're going to lead it off this week by talking about trade down scenarios. It's a topic that's near and dear to Phil and I's hearts. And I've been trying to convince people of the notion, Phil, that it's not a horrible idea to trade down in the NFL draft. I found a guy to back me up. It's Eric Eager from Sumer Sports. Eric, hit it. Hit it. If I were in charge, I'd trade down just because, you know, Jaden Daniels is phenomenal as far as a prospect, but there are some concerns, you know, pressure to sack ratio. Like sack avoidance is the number one. You look at Patrick Mahomes, down year statistically. He averaged three yards fewer per attempt than Brock Purdy did this year, but he was second in the NFL in sack avoidance to Josh Allen. Josh Allen would be second in MVP voting this year. And so Jaden Daniels, he took a sack on 20% of pressures this year, 30% last year for LSU, and that's something that carries. And so when you think about the Patriots having to rebuild the offensive line, having to rebuild the receiving core, when you have a quarterback that struggles with pressure, struggles when a when the wide receivers aren't open, and a, that's going to be hard to build an offense around. We saw it in Washington with Sam Howell. That's another guy with a high pressure to sack ratio. For young quarterbacks, it's just not conducive to success. So, unless they can go up and get Williams, go up and get May, I just don't think that it's a good gamble for them. And so I think moving back, and you know, you could end up with a player like Bo Nix, you can end up with a player like Michael Penix. Michael Penix, by the way, under 10% of his pressures as a college quarterback turned into sacks. So that's a guy with quick processing uh, and, and could do that even in an offense where you're kind of building up the line or something like that. So I would prescribe a trade, a trade back because there are gonna be a lot of teams in a down year offensively in the NFL that are gonna be desperate for a quarterback. Not long after we had one of Eric's colleagues, former NFL general, general manager Thomas Dimitrov from Sumer Sports. Join us. Thomas took the opposite viewpoint. I want you to confirm for me the best move for the New England Patriots in the 2024 draft is trade the hell down. He's so hot on this, Thomas. He's dying for you to confirm this theory that he has that that's trade the best down. Thing for you don't to need do. to buy a Corvette and park it in front of a pup tent so it's it's a great point and you are in a great spot where but i think there are some really interesting quarterbacks this year right i'm excited about them remember you're talking to a guy that used to phrase trader thomas in, in atlanta so i if i ever did come back as a general manager i would be much more mindful of the trading down having worked in data for the last two or three years so you talk about trading down you talk about really smart people and understanding the real PhD in our business is a guy like Eric Eager, who you just had here. Impressive guy, right? I learn from those guys all the time, but then I have to like pull my hair out sometimes when I'm talking to these outrageously smart guys. Like, come down a little bit and understand this is still football. We're folding in data and we're learning more and we're augmenting, as I've always said. I love that, but we're not doing PhDs in mathematics yet. We're building football teams. So if you don't like the quarterback, if you don't like Drake May and he's sitting there, if you don't like Jaden Daniels, Phil, and he's sitting there. The smart thing to do, Phil, is to get to the side of the plane, position your parachute, jump, and pull the rickboard. Okay. So, Tom, that's correct if you don't like the guy. But what if you like the guy and you still know you have all these holes on your roster? So that's my question for you, Thomas. If you feel as though Drake May or Jaden Daniels, say those are the two quarterbacks that are potentially available to the Patriots through overall, you feel as though they have Pro Bowl upside or even all pro upside. Do you take them knowing that your roster isn't very good and it might be a rough year one for that quarterback because you don't know what's on the line, you don't know what's at receiver, or do you say it's just not our time at that position? Let's build everything else and drop the quarterback in later. Look, as much as I want to understand what, what you are saying because you've been around this a long time, I picked Matt Ryan. My yeah. very first pick ever was a third-round overall pick, and because I wanted him so much. If we did not pick Matt Ryan, I would have been in this business two years, not 13. So I have a little bit of a different perspective. If you have a guy, to your point, that, I, that you really like, 
in that you know that in the next, if you're a good scouting department, a good management group, you definitely get your scouts knowing what's out there two, three, and four years away. That's a big thing. If you think there's going to be a bad run like back in the day when Atlanta didn't take a quarterback three or four years ago, that was a bad two or three years of really trying to figure out. So if you're here now with some really good quarterbacks, that's when you have to really sit down and decide, is it best to trade back or is it best to get your guy now? And that, that has a lot to do. Who's going to be your new GM? I mean, that's a whole other thing, right? If you get a guy who's been a GM before and he's like, is not as wigged out by that, maybe he doesn't do that. If you're a first-time GM, it's different. Do you get wigged out by the public pressure? You're Elliot Wolf, you're Macro, you're Gerard Mayo. The entire planet knows you need a quarterback, but the people who go granular say, we need a lot more than that. We should stock up. We should trade down with Atlanta to eight. We should make the smart move here, get two first-round picks for next year. Now we have the collateral to move up. That's the smart thing to do, but it's also going to cause a late April insurrection. How much does the outside noise and perhaps even the pressure from the owner, who I don't think is going to be over the top, but you need a hood ornament for your franchise right now. No question there's pressure out there for that. I mean, again, you go as your quarterback goes. We know that. But, but what are you going to do instead? And, again, you have to have the, the proper plan. If you don't do that and you trade back, okay, let's say you're not getting the top five, but let's say you're getting Bo Nix. I don't know, who, who, whoever it yeah. might be. Whoever might be there. And then all of a sudden, three games in, four games in, you're like, oh, my God, is this reminiscent of? That's a tough place to be in, right? Look. I love it. If you love your guy, you got to go for him. And then you have to be very smart in how you're putting your team together. If you have the right GM, and they're not just about getting one or two players here and there, but they have a really good insight of how they're going to build their team and have, have the foresight to say, in the next two or three years, we're going to do it this way, then I think you can pick the quarterback. If you're just here and now and you're always doing the now, here and now stuff, I don't think you have a chance. And I think at that point, you'd really have to think about moving back. This is absolute sustenance for us because it's going to be the ongoing conversation. What do you want in your quarterback? Do you want it now? Does that guy at number three satisfy it? And if not, does the guy at number two, do you trade up? Phil, to me, this is the driver of all conversation, and it can be the driver of the direction of the team through 2028. There's no doubt about it because if you get the right guy, you're in the mix in a positive way for maybe the next decade, Tom. If you end up hitting, a la Matt Ryan, a la the Bengals model with Joe Burrow. I think that's what Dimitrov was really driving at was even though the roster stinks, the same way the roster stunk in Cincinnati in 2020, if the right guy is there, you take the right guy because you don't know when you'll have the opportunity to get him again. I find it really interesting that that Eric, the guy that we had on for next pats, is more in line with your view and Thomas is a little bit more in line with my view, though I did recently put, put together a mock draft where the Patriots traded down, and the outcome was kind of interesting, Tom, because they also traded for Justin Fields. Like the, You can get really creative mm-hmm. with it if you decide the quarterbacks that are at the top of the draft aren't for us, or they're good players, it's just it's not the right, right. time for us because we're not argument. ready for him. That's my argument because what you've done then is you've extended the game. You now will have... Two first-round picks. If you do it right, you're going to have two first-round picks for next year. I keep using Atlanta as a perfect example. You trade down with the Falcons. You take the eighth overall pick. You still spend it on tackle, edge, receiver. And then next year you have two firsts to dangle over whoever. Then you go and take Spencer Rattler, flavor of the week, because he had a good senior bowl week of practice. Or Bo Nix or Penix. Sure. In the first or second, excuse me, in the second round. Well, you don't bother with that. You do take Spencer Rattler in round four. Rattler. Um, Great name. But to me, it's you've, you've pushed it down and not put all your chips on one number. The only problem is, just to counter, the problem is if it's Joe Burrow that's sitting there for you at three. Because then you have a fourth-round pick and Rattler, who in all likelihood, quarterbacks taken that point in the draft, don't turn out to much. And then you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting, and the roster might be pretty good. The way it was in San Francisco, Tom, for years, and they had Jimmy Garoppolo, they actually got all the way to a Super Bowl, and they still said, eh, we don't have enough of quarterback. We better move heaven and earth to make sure we get the right guy. This is why this conversation's awesome, because Joe Burrow's the perfect example to 
segue into the next conversation that we have with Eric Eager. And Eric was actually on with Phil for the Next Pats podcast. I'm going to strongly recommend you listen to this whole thing with Phil and Eric on the Next Pats. But I wanted to sample from it because I'm sitting over here in a uh, media room here at the Super Bowl, and I heard this. I was like, ooh, this guy's great. And then I said, Phil, ask him about the weather. And this is what Eric Eager had to say. So I said, hey, crazy weather we're having here in Vegas, isn't it, Eric? It's rainy and cold. I thought we were in the desert. Did you do the job the way you're supposed to do it and stop dinking around. <laughs> what do you think you're in Vegas? Think you're soapy sales? Listen to me. This is great because Joe Burrow is the highest paid quarterback in the league. Joe Burrow is injured quite a bit. Joe Burrow took a monumental number of sacks in his first couple of years. Joe Burrow also succeeded because of a variety of physical skills. Jimmy Garoppolo, good quarterback, good. The Average. definitive of good quarterback. He's an 80. He's a 78 to an 82, somewhere in there. But he got to a Super Bowl, but he's also too injury plagued. Here's what Eric Eager had to say about finding a quarterback who can withstand weather and withstand a battering. Is anything that you have looked at pertinent when it comes to how these guys might perform in bad weather? Because the options we think the Patriots will have would be Drake May, Jane Daniels, maybe some of the second-round quarterbacks yep. that are in the mix as well, or later first-round guys. Is anyone in that mix a bad weather quarterback? Because we know that's when the Patriots, you would think, play their most important games is December or January. Yeah, we don't have any measurements, but like, I do think one of the biggest L's the analytics community took was Josh Allen, when you looked at his college data, you know, we, we were good enough at adjusting for that, right? The weather, you know, you can actually tie to it, wind and all that stuff. But the traits, right? You look at Joe Burrow, who, in my opinion, is a phenomenal quarterback. I think he's always, in my mind, going to be a little bit of a step below Herbert, Allen, Mahomes, because when he's injured, he's just a little worse. And so when I look at quarterbacks sometimes now, I look at the physical traits matter in overcoming weather and injuries and i think you know williams has a lot of great he's a rubbery arm and all this he's a, he's under six feet i mean he's gonna come in at under six feet uh, i think there, there's some things you know to that uh, i think daniels is kind of thin right he kind of reminds me from a, a build standpoint of jim mcmahon who was a, a real it was a winner but he never played 16 games for the bears he never played in that you know he never was able to uh after that super bowl win start a whole season I look at Drake May from a from a size perspective. You saw him on the side of that basketball game in UNC. I, I think size to me is the biggest thing for injuries, but also weather. And, and that's why Josh Allen, I know the Bills haven't won the ultimate game yet, but it's why the Bills are in it every single year and are resilient to all the perturbations in football, which is weather, which is injuries. The guy never misses a game. He, you never see that big of a drop in his play. It's because he has that physical gift, and that's you know it takes it back to the old school scouting where you know you do really want to have that big physical quarterback because when the injuries come inevitably and when the weather is bad, you need a guy that's going to be able to rip a ball through you know that tough weather and 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 within injuries to his body. It's a fascinating answer that you give because you're right. It does marry old school football yeah. philosophy with the data. You have a wider margin for error. If you're bigger, stronger, you can work through a thumb injury or a yeah. calf injury, or you can cut it through a 25 mile, mile an hour wind. Yeah, Justin Herbert played all of the 2022 season with broken ribs. And no, and you know, it was more legitimate than everybody was saying. And now, granted, they were not the best team in the league, but he got them to 10 and seven in a playoff berth playing through that because he's just more physically gifted. Now, he didn't play the greatest, but I guarantee you some of these less physically gifted quarterbacks who are accurate and all this, Joe Burrow is probably not playing as well as Herbert with the same injury because he's just simply not as big, fast, and strong as Justin is. When Phil finished, he was all excited about this because he's like, wow, that's like a confluence of the two eras, the big, strong, strapping pocket quarterback and also the squirrely guy who can move around. Well, and it's, it's philosophies coming together too, right? Because you could find the most old-school football scout who would come to you, and if you asked about the quarterback position, he would say, I want him to be six foot four. I want him to be able to throw it through a brick wall and I want him to be able to stand tall in the pocket and see the entire defense. That's old school thinking. But the analytics part of it and the data would suggest, well, you also want this guy because 
if you're faced with adverse situations, whether it's weather-related or injury-related, that guy's going to have a better chance at pushing through those things because of his physical talents than someone who is a little bit more slightly built or a little bit shorter or a little bit weaker armed, like Joe Burrow. I, I thought Eric's example was a pretty good one. He's comparing Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow. One guy is big, strapping, monster arm. He could play with a broken thumb and still be pretty good, whereas the other guy might be a little bit more inhibited. So that to me is that's a point in favor of Drake May. And you're hoping that you can kind of mold that ball of clay, that quarterbacking ball of clay that may appear to be, and hope that those tools, which some of these other guys at the top of the draft don't have, allow him to overcome more and reach his potential in a way that those other players can't. I wanted to cut the initial thing that Eric said about trading down right at a conversation he had about Jaden Daniels. And Jaden Daniels numbers in terms of sack avoidance and dealing with pressure and throwing while under pressure. It's really fascinating. Again, listen to the next Pats podcast because not only does he make the the point on Jaden Daniels and why it's a little bit of a dice roll that you might not see because of sack avoidance and the importance of that, but also with Lamar Jackson, he makes a great point to say, look, he's going to be the MVP. He's an exquisite player. I sound like Doris Burke. Exquisite. He's an exquisite player. It's a good word. But he also is starting to slow down just a smidge physically. The plays that he made three or four years ago are not the same ones he makes now. Still, brilliant player, could go out and run for 1,100 if he wants to, but you're going to see a a diminishment of skills that you won't with a guy who can't run in the first place. (laughs) Uh, We have so much more from Thomas Dimitrov. We're going to get to the rest of that interview right now on whether he'd come back to New England, whether he'd be interested in that. The benefit of a football overlord with a franchise, and also Bill Belichick's future. Enjoy all of this, and we'll see you tomorrow with so much more from the Super Bowl. What a day! You bring up, if you have the right GM, the Patriots right now don't have a general manager, Thomas. I'm curious because we talk about you all the time. I don't know how closely you're following NBC Sports Boston and our coverage, (laughs) but we do talk about you all the time. Would you ever have any interest and making your way back to Foxborough and being general manager of the Patriots. You know what's interesting? I love, I mean, they're always my favorite second team. They were, when, even when I was in Atlanta, right, I, I loved the AFC. What about the irony of going there and getting your ass kicked in that Super Bowl by the team you supposedly love? That was such a bad, we don't even need to bring that yeah, up. Yeah, no. But I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around. all at his own. Yeah, we're going to blow right <laughs> No, past. I went there all my, I know. But, but to your point, I, I daydream about a lot of different things in this business now. I've been out, this is my third year. I always thought, honestly, I would be out two or three years. And I truly, I would maybe do a PhD. I like to call it a PhD. It's not a PhD. Let's just call it a master's in data. Just to fold in, because I'm a football guy at the core. But to be able to fold in some extra elements, I think, is a really good sell point. So I have thought about okay, what's the next step now? Three years out, would I consider places? And yet it flies by pretty fast, mm-hmm. right? We saw that. You guys are in an interesting spot there with your GMs, though, potential GMs, right? Because I've heard, Mr. Kraft, I think, have they not talked about this being done in the, in the spring? So after he did say draft? something to that effect at Gerard Mayo's introductory press conference where he said, we will have someone, we will appoint, was the word he used, appoint someone to make roster decisions when the time comes. Does that mean... They just say, Elliot Wolf, you're going to retain the director of scouting title, which he has now, but you're also going to be our lead personnel person. Does it mean they hire a GM, whether it's Thomas Dimitrov or assistant GM of the Chiefs right now, Mike Borgonzi or somebody else? I don't know. There's still a lot of questions about the timing of that kind of move and who it would be. Why? Is, is there any merit to a football overlord position like oh. Parcells oh, was? Oh, my gosh. Like, Get me started on that because I believe there is. But – Here's how I understand. Here's my belief in how it needs to be done. When you're talking, and I hate the word czar, whatever we call it. Do you it, like right? Overlord? I kind of Overlord like Overlord. is kind of kind of mobster like, or is that like yeah, Boston like Mass? Or, it what like was that movie? Rooting and you know, yeah, yeah, not talking to anyone. Just as they yeah. tie. And <laughs> but the Overlord, the was. Overlord idea. It's interesting you say that because I do believe there are organizations around here that could really benefit from some of those guys. This isn't just about us, you know, pumping the fifty-something-year-old. Sorry, I know you're young. But, I mean, every once in a while, look, if you get a 50-something-year-old who has been a GM for 15-plus years and have a really good understanding, have been in the league a long time, and they go in and they understand that they're going in to help 
the GM and the head coach be successful. Understand this. If you're a, a, a czar that comes in and you're making that new GM mm -hmm. and the head coach paranoid and insecure, I don't think it works. Don't make the decisions for them. Tell them how to make the right. decisions. And so I, you know, I would say this to... I'd say this to a number of different owners that I have talked to. Tie that contract to that guy, and it's not easy for, from a former coach, but if you have a former personnel guy, because I do believe it needs to be a personnel man, not, not a former head coach, who knows about building, tie his contract to the success of that GM and head coach, meaning you're not around his back going to the owner telling that ah, these guys don't know what the heck to do. Them. Throw me in this job. Let me take care of all this. You really have a vested interest in making that GM and that head coach successful. Then I think you have something. You, you, you play out a big contract, write it all in success. But in three years, if that head coach and GM aren't doing well, you're out the door too. That's meaning, what I believe. When you say tie the contract to, meaning you have escalators in your contract. If somebody else comes in and you're helping a GM and a head coach, hey, if they win X number of playoff games or they get to a Super Bowl, then you benefit from that as well. No question. Here's I think what's wild about stuff. that? Then you could have, and I guess you guys are all should be at this juncture successful enough and secure enough where you're not saying, oh, I need that escalator especially if you're a guy in your mid to late 50s or whatever, so that you can say, look, we can definitely win if we start veteran quarterback X, Gardner Minshew here in this game, and try and make a run to get ourselves to 10 wins instead of putting Daniels in there. And I'm just using for instance. Yeah, sure. Instead of putting Daniels sure. in there now and letting him develop for the last however many games. It would be beneficial to keep going with Gardner Minshew if you were the GM. You're saying the Sage personnel guy might be be able to have a longer take a longer view yeah. relative to the younger people that are in those hey, jobs. We can go it's a great the, point. We can go kick the crap out of this team if we start Minshew, but we need to get the other guys some reps here. Well, and, and, and that's a big thing, and I love that thought. <clears throat> you get, you know, if you get a 42-year-old who has maybe been a GM for six years and you think he's good, but he comes in and he's, he's thinking about the next wave. I hate to say this, but a lot of those guys that have been in their mid-50s and have been around it a long time, if you look at some of the list of former GMs who are executives who could be that position, they've kind of already made their millions, so to speak, whatever that is. They're not in there worried about their contracts as much as, I want to come back in, I want to win a Super Bowl for this organization, and I want to help these guys grow. That's a cool, we're all... I will tell, tell you, most of the people that are in, at my stage are like, I, I have this drive to truly mentor and, and mentoring like that, I think, could be a really good thing. Unfortunately, there haven't been a lot of owners talking about it, mm -hmm. right? Back in the day, they used to bring in Bill Parcells or Mike Holmgren. We saw it with, with my buddy Dave Caldwell down in, in, in uh, Jacksonville. They bring in a great coach. I mean, we know that with Tom Coughlin, but that got cumbersome. Tom comes in, Dave's in there. It's just, it's a little bit, it's a little bit messed up. Yep. I think you pick the right people, and I think it can happen. I'm wondering, Thomas, if you view the setup that they have now. Let's say there's a scenario in which they keep what they have now, which is Drum is a new head coach. He'll have say on personnel because he's going to be the guy playing the players. But you have Elliot Wolf and you have Matt Groh, and, and it's not really clear who's in charge. Can that be problematic? It can be problematic. Both of those guys I like, by the way, a lot. I like Elliot a lot, and I've gotten to know Matt over the last year and a half a lot more. And we've talked, believe it or not, we've talked analytics as well and data and where the league is going. So, I, you know, he's a very smart guy. Um, I know that there was something that went down there with the players. Didn't something go down? Wasn't it, wasn't it Adrian Clem? Was it a former player? Did they have? No, I don't want to get well, into Adrian that. Adrian Clem was there as the offensive line yeah. coach, ended up having a health issue, health issue. had to okay. take off. They, they were very sh they're short staffed, short I would staff. say, on the coaching staff. Okay. And in the front office, but I'm just I'm I not sure. I think they sure were rankled. Going... They were rankled. Some of the players, excuse me, some of the position coaches were position. rankled at the level that's of talent. That, that's that's what at. I was yes, getting. That at. wasn't yeah. a story. Yeah. At the end of the year here. Yes. But I think Matt and I think Elliot. Yeah, I think if they're there, whatever they you know whatever they do, they're both personnel people who know their world well. I just it's tough when you it, to coexist if you had a you know the co CEO the co that's not even what it's called co GM co personnel thing. That triangle gets, of authority that's Tom a, keeps bringing up yeah. from the Pete Carroll Pete days Carroll, in Carroll, Bobby England. Greer. That's, and, that's not easy. Andy Wozenchuk oh, and then Robert not, over the oh, top. Oh, Andy too. Yeah, that's not an easy thing. So you can end up with tension. You can end up with tension in the personnel room. You can end up with tension between position coaches and, and personnel because everybody has so much at stake, their anxiety rises. Their reputations are attached. With Bill Belichick, the culture was a certain way, and fear was a big motivator. Always, I think, among other things that he was able to tap into. We are potentially going to see a whipsaw of the culture in which it's more open, more comfortable, more accepting, more fostering and nurturing. 
silos are going to be demolished, walls are going to be broken down, according to Gerard. How does a team guard against whipsawing so far that it causes a culture shock among the players in there, and maybe the entire organization? I watched it happen, Bill Parcells to Pete Carroll. The players acted like he was a substitute teacher. I mean, everything, everything but the paper airplanes. How does Gerard <laughs> guard against that? That's, it's a great point. I think it's incumbent upon Gerard to, mi- to make sure that he doesn't, and that he's very aware of that, and that he doesn't go the opposite end of the spectrum. Look, I, when, when, when Mike Smith and I took over in Atlanta, he was coming off of the Bobby Petrino thing, right? And Mike is a good, good guy, mm-hmm. and, and yet he, was, he had a toughness enough about him, but he also knew he needed to be mindful of what was there before. As we know that you know, Coach Mayo needs to understand what, what Bill did and what he might need to change for sure. But to go the opposite end of the spectrum can be, can be troublesome because all of a sudden, if, if now you move away from being uber accountable to not being as accountable, and I'm not saying that would happen with sure. him, but it's the fear of that. If I'm a general manager, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm watching it closely to make sure that yes, I get it, new day, and you need to be mindful about your players and you need to interact. I mean, I think Dan Quinn is great at that. We can talk about Dan another time too. Dan, Dan's going in there with, with uh, um, Adam Peters coexisting and how important it is to make sure that Dan comes in, comes in really aggressive and upbeat, but he also has an accountable side that a lot of people think that Dan's more just a player coach. No, Dan will fight you, um, figuratively speaking, right? He'll call you out. Will, will your new head coach call you out there something that I don't know. I think it's important, right? I think, very quickly, I think a guy like uh, Raheem Morris will call his players out. As pumped up and energetic as he is, I've seen him there as a D coordinator. He will call him out. Will Jod? Yeah. See, I think he will, one million Good. percent, be a hard, tough, disciplined coach. Good. But the culture of, I don't want to have, I don't want to do this X, Y, or Z, or show up late X, Y, or Z, because I might be kicked out of the, I might be gone. I don't know if that will necessarily exist or the looseness of a practice or any of those things. I think the voice too. I think it would be a different voice. I think you'll hear a lot of the same messages in terms of hard work and accountability. It'll just be a different voice, a different tone. I want to ask you about, we're talking about the new coach, ask you about the old coach because you're very familiar with everything that's going down there in Atlanta and very familiar with Arthur Blank, having worked for him for a long time. Why did that not work out, Thomas? Well, because it seemed like it was so close. I thought it was so close. I was I was on my board every day, put 90-10, 90-10, thinking it was 100, close to 100. Well, not 90. I'm a data guy now, right? Yep, I can't yep. say 100 <laughs> if I'm saying 90-10. But it was literally, I was thinking, it's that's going to happen. I think the two of them got along well. I think, interestingly enough, I'm pretty well the only person in the country that knows both of them to the level I do. Scott Pioli, of course, does. Scott, But Scott wasn't working with, with Arthur in the same way that I did. So I think both of those guys could work well together. One was, uh, what, Bill's 72? About one. to be 72. Almost 72. Uh, Arthur's 81. So there was, you know, whatever, 10-ish years, whatever it is. And I think... Um, I, I, nine. I think the, the situation that they could work together I thought was mo- moving along well. Then I started hearing a lot in the media that there was, you probably heard it from Tom Pelissaro, maybe not, maybe I don't want to out Tom. Tom's, I like Tom a lot. But there was this phrase that there was an inner cabal, this, this cabal happening. I, that's a pretty strong word, right? Yeah, I, it is. I, I actually had to look it up to see the true definition of it because I mean I know what it is politically but how is it in football and has it happened before there was a lot of talk that inside the building that a lot of the people that were there knew that that you know coach Belichick was going to come in he was going to want his people around and and look we don't need to get into this but I believe arguably the the very best in, that this league has ever had does deserve the right to come in and do that if you want that and I, and I do believe, and I've that. said this publicly, that I don't think there's another head coach out there in the next three to four years that has a better shot, you guys could argue with me about this, better shot at getting that team to the Super Bowl than Bill, if you do it the way that Bill wants to do it, right? And, and then, of course, you have to have a quarterback there. That's my thought. Um, it's unfathomable that he doesn't have a job right now, just like it's unfathomable that, I mean, Vrabel doesn't have a job. Mm-hmm. And it honestly was before Dan didn't get a job. I thought these three men are not going to have a job. So anyway, I'm, I don't mean no, no, to no, protract it's... here, but I just think Bill, the way that you know he goes into to their uh, into Atlanta and and 
spends time, talks about what he wants. I mean, it was pretty public that he was going to keep um, uh, Terry Fontenot. Yep. The guy, the, the, the GM who replaced me, that they were going to work together. Now, the Rich McKay stuff was a little different. You saw that. All right, the president... Rich, he and Rich weren't going to necessarily function together. I'm surprised that they couldn't work together. Phil and I talked about that. You yeah. got two guys who are older. Rich McKay is kind of salt of the earth, unless it's just a facade that I notice from the outside yeah, looking I mean, in. Rich has been around a long time, right? And I, I figured yeah. the two guys of that age could find common ground, even if they didn't agree on the friggin' pass interference and yeah. defensive holding rules. Right. They could find some common ground because Rich was doing his job with the competition committee to make the game more palatable, and Bill's trying to win games. So, yeah. of course, there's going to be a at cross purposes at points but it's a people business right yeah and if, if yeah. relationships and bill's not one to really look at people early yeah. on it, yeah. it can be hard to but but make you sure got, those work in a situation right. like that and you guys saw though after the fact right that was not the issue and again there wasn't an issue but the idea of terry fontenot and co right some of that group that was in there uh chris olson who's a cap guy and different people that have been in there a long time that it starts coming down to that, knowing that, you know, of course, Bill's going to put his people around, whoever that was. And then you go back to Rich, and, you know, Rich, after that, they moved on from Bill. They hire Raheem Morris, and then it came out in the media the very next day. Arthur said Rich is being moved up and away to the AMBSE, so that's Arthur's Sports and Entertainment CEO, and he no longer is interacting with football. That's a big deal. Rich... I, I'm not answering for Rich, of course, because Rich, you said, he's very, he's adept and he's been around a long time, very smart man. He decided that he was going to be moved away from football. That's not easy after you think Raheem's coming in and maybe, you know, it'll go back to status quo. Mm -hmm. It's not. So to, to Arthur's credit, he heard the people in the city. There was a lot of people throwing back. And Rich, is, Rich has been there a long time, 20-something years. When you're somewhere like that, I, I feel like... Even my years at being there 13 years, there were people clapping when you leave, right? If, you're, if you have a strong enough hand about you, there's always going to be people saying, hey, it's, it's time. Yep. Yeah, so, anyway. Do you think, Thomas, Bill will get a job next year? Because I'm guessing if Arthur was steadfast in wanting Bill, all Rich or Terry or anybody in the building who didn't necessarily agree would have to say, he went 4-13, his 2021 rebuild, the free agency money was poorly spent, they could not develop a first-round quarterback who seemed pretty talented. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers rebuilt post Brady quicker than Bill did. Why do we want to hire this guy? I mean, that's, that's the evidence against the greatest coach of all time, which he certainly is in 2025 when he's, the next cycle comes up. I think in the end, I mean, many of us who have been in this football league for a long time, we realize, again, I'm, I'm not being overly stated here, but – Never has there been an opportunity to acquire arguably the best head coach in the history of this league who didn't just retire in his, at his last organization. Never have the ownership group that's in place now or never has GMs had an opportunity to pull someone. So do you step back and you look at all the things that you need to, to look at and say, okay, okay, we'll make the adjustments because we think we have a shot at winning the Super Bowl with this guy who's a tactical and a um in my mind a situational mastermind mm -hmm. and believe me i've been around some good coaches none of them are of the level of bill that way and i think they would agree i'm not being negative towards anyone like that this guy is special that way so i'm just thinking and i do know and i won't mention names there are people out there right now who have head coaches in their building and if they could convince their owners to move on they would do it in a heartbeat for bill belichick all right that's our guy thomas dimitrov